All right. So you guys are, uh, are you, are you guys hearing me well? Yes. Right. Yes. So the reason, one of the reasons I wanted to do this first and foremost is because there's a lot of controversy uh, about the subject of healing um, in the Christendom, you know, movement. And um, we see it exclusively in um, different denominations around the world. So throughout the world, we've got different denominations going on. People are associating themselves and affiliating themselves with different denominations that, you know, ought not to be so. Why? Because it's not even biblical. Now, the Bible calls us to not be part of any denomination. And unfortunately, many of many denominations, confessions of faith, would tell you, for example, that healing is no longer for today. So I wanted to approach this uh, with delicacy and also with uh, diligence tonight by going back to the word. And as you guys know, the word is a double-edged sword uh, and the word speaks for itself. So instead of pouring anything from our own opinion in the word, let's actually see what the word says about itself. The word speaks in such abundance, in such wisdom, in such entrustment of knowledge because the word itself is the very character of God. And we ought to let the word speak for itself. And we don't really care as to what man or women would say out there, right? People that actually point another pastor say that man or such and such said this about healing. What we wanna know is what God says about healing. The question as um, I told you earlier is expressively, is healing still for today? And if so, how do we get healed according to the word of God? And can we get healed completely? So something that um, was downing on my heart to actually share with you today. And the reason, the second reason why I wanted to do this is because there's so many debates around the world and some intellectual Christians out there, self-professed Christians, uh, would like to actually say that healing is something that God could do only if he wills, right? Only if God desires, as if God is not a God that, um, you know, stands by his word. Now, I expressively said earlier that, you know, we believe the word of God. We believe it because God says that his promises are yes and amen. When God says something, when he makes a statement, he's not a man that he would lie, the word says, all right? He's not Rafi. He's not Hassan, right? He's not Neil, guilty of maybe lying sometimes, you know, white lies are in there, Tanya or whoever it is. God is a God that is a covenant keeping God of his people, meaning that whenever God promises something, guess what? He does keep his word, all right? So that's one thing first. Um, second, I want to tell you about a little story. I told Brother Rafi about this the other day, and the reason why this was actually dawning on my heart once again to share with you is because, you know, there are people out there, unfortunately, uh, especially Christians, that will come and debate with you about everything in the Bible. And just for the sake of winning an argument, they'll throw in, hey, you know, the, the fishy catch. You know, I want, to, I want to catch you in your own words. Like, you're not a real pastor. You're not called by God. Because they don't have the understanding of the word of God that is on a deeper level. They don't have the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, they'll come up with intellectual reasoning, right? And they'll try to catch you in your game and tell you that you're wrong about what you're advancing. And, and I've had a brother, unfortunately, who I loved a lot, who I was kind of sick and tired at some point to um, always debate with him. And I, I felt every time he, you know, reached out to me, you know, these kinds of, kind of brothers that all, every time they reach out to you, it's just a debate, you know, it's like, let's study the word to see how smart we are and how many people we can debate, how many people we can, um, uh, you know, outsmart. And unfortunately, I had to cut off that brother because the Bible says that from such people you have to turn away from. Many have a form of godliness. And um, before I start laying out whether, you know, healing is something which we live by today, which we can be completely acknowledging and also, you know, assessing our lives, um, I want to lay out the foundation. The foundation is such that, um, what was I saying? I think I'm, I'm, I'm losing my, my, my train of thoughts here. So the foundation is that um, the Holy Spirit teaches us all things. All right. That's what I wanted to get down to. We don't need men. I mean, men are going to help us out with our weaknesses. Men are going to edify us. Men are going to teach us, right? We teach each other. We can learn from each other. But ultimately, the Holy Spirit is the one that does the whole work in us. Can you, can you agree to say, to, to say amen to that? Amen, amen. I agree. All right. So the Holy Spirit tells us expressively out of the words of the Holy Spirit verbatim in the book of John, the first epistle. You don't have to turn there, by the way, that we have no need that man teach us, but that the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us will teach us these things. So, of course, when man teaches these things, because we have to understand that there's a reference to the Holy Spirit. You know, for these men and these women to teach something to other people, they would have, they would have had to, to have the Holy Spirit inside of them already. 
But the Holy Spirit is the cornerstone of all things. He's the one that teaches us. He's the one that entrusts us with knowledge and wisdom. So we go back to the word of God, the living word of God, which is the rhema. What is the word of God? It's the very projection of God's essence and character to our Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. The word is not only a matter of reading it, but it's a matter of understanding it, believing it, and reapplying it in our lives, right? Amen. And God bless you, sister. And the Lord gives us that counseling through the Holy Spirit. He gives us that understanding, that deepening of the Holy uh, of, of the Word through the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. So 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that the Word of God is profitable for instruction, reproof, and also for correction for the man of God to be made perfect, right, in righteousness. That's what the second book of Timothy, third chapter, verse 16 says, and the word of God is like a double-edged sword. So you've watched me actually drink my, uh, sip on my beverage earlier, right? As much as this is important, this is, you know, bodily nourishment for us. And what matters even more is the word of God that is spiritual nourishment that comes from heaven, right? The word of God that we feed on. All right, so the Bible says the word of God we have to feed on. Not every word mm -hmm. of man, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise Amen. the Lord. And, and Jesus himself fed on this word as well at, at a very young age. Amen. And he was expanding in truth and in um, spirit, the Bible says, right? The yeah. more he was growing mm -hmm. in the word which was coming from God, the more he was received from the glory of the Father, the more he was expanding in truth and in spirit as well, right? And just like Amen. he wants to also do it because the servant is not above the master. Amen. So let's start. Let's actually turn to, uh, will you please, um, Psalm 107, verse 20. And the reason why I want you to go there, guys, once again, is because I want to show you that if we commit to God for healing, God can heal us. Now, don't get me wrong, and I'm pretty sure that some people that will be watching will probably try to pull the, wor the worms out of my nose and out of my mouth. I'm not saying that it's going to happen instantly. What I'm saying is that if we believe by faith, it shall be given unto us according to God's timing and in perfect season, right? That's so all I'm saying. So sometimes God will appoint struggles and also infirmities and sicknesses or pain to happen so we may learn to commune with our Lord Jesus Christ through his sufferings. Now, it doesn't mean that I'll be instantly healed. It simply means that God has heard my prayer, but according to my faith, it shall be given unto me. Now, I might be healed today. I might be healed tomorrow. I may be healed in a week from now. I may be healed in a month from now. But God's will does not change in terms of whether God wants us to be healed or not. So today's healing is accurate. It is still for today's day and age. And we can still be provided that healing. We can still grab hold of that healing. We can believe the promises of God. I'm going to show you why God wills that we heal, not only spiritually, but physically. Because you see many Christians out there want to discredit the word of God and say that, hey, it is speaking about spiritual healing rather than physical healing, which is not false. But we can see both phases laid out for us in the Bible, both physical and spiritual at the same time. All right, guys? Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. I mean, can you, can you said uh, some what exactly? I'm going to go there. So Psalm 107, verse 20. Let's break that word down. Psalm 107, verse 20. Would you please turn there? Hallelujah. I'm so excited. I don't know if you guys, but I'm super excited about this. Yes. Amen. Can't you tell I'm so excited? Huh? This is my excited face. <laughs> hey, man, I see that. Man. I see that's that's uh, the biggest laugh you've ever you've ever laughed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always excited when we open the Bible, man. I just don't show it from the outside sometimes. See your smile, bro. You know, there's joy in being with the brethren. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. There's joy in reading the Word of God because the Word of God is like a double-edged sword that cuts through the bar the marrow and the bones. It is revealing of what God wants and revealing of what God does not want, all right? So Psalm 107, verse 20, yes. I'm going to read. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Now, I'm not reading in context here because all I want you to know is that the word healing here, if you look it up, it's Kali, according to the interlinear you know, Hebrew Bible. So it is not spiritual healing this is about, that is physical 
you know, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 spiritual, th that is the inside, but this is the outwardly healing. This is a physical healing that this is about. So the word healing in this case, okay, equals to physical healing, all right? So we don't deny that there's spiritual healing in the Bible, but in this very case, what this is about, the word here, if you translate it back in Hebrew, right, the terminology stands for a physical healing. So I want you to write that write down, down, please. So Koli mm -hmm. is a physical healing, C-H-O-L-I. And you'll see why I'm making you write this. So once again, I'm going to read it just for the sake of you understanding the importance of how much God wants to heal us. He sent out his word and healed them. Now, notice that the Lord is saying that the word is what heals us. All right. The word of God, as I said earlier, the word of God, not only is it a fundamentally, you know, a, a, a written word that we read and we understand, we meditate on, but it goes as far as actually believing in that word. It is a word that ought to be believed and to be reapplied back in our lives because it is precious and there's authority and power in the word of God to heal us. And you've got the proof right there on display, right before your eyes. Verse 20 says, he sent out his word, he who, the Lord, and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Mm -hmm. And once again, what this word stands for here, the terminology used in Hebrew indicates that it's physical healing and not spiritual healing. Are you guys with me? Yes. Amen. So right from the get-go, the Lord is saying, if you do commit to the word of God, for healing, God will provide that kind of healing and he will yank you out of darkness, out of destruction, right? Because if you're not healed, if you're sick, what it brings upon you brings anxiety, distresses, nervous breakdowns, and all of the following. And you find yourself in a place of unrestfulness. You want to be restful. You want to be resting at Jesus' feet. You want to be, you know, calm. You want to feel the comfort and the peace of the Lord. And unless you believe in the word of God, you won't, that, you won't have these kind of promises. Why? Because you are doubting the word of God. So that just shows me something here, my friends, is that we ought to believe in the word of God. When we take the word of God and read it, we have to understand that the word of God is very much alive and very much, you know, still for today. Because the word of God is the same yesterday, today, and for, forevermore. You know, many people, many Christians will say, hey, the word of God is settled in heaven forever and ever. They'll quote to you, for example, that heaven and, and earth will pass away, but the word of God will not never pass away. That God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But yet, they discredit the word of God, try to disprove it, and tell you that the spirit has changed, that the word of God is not to be taken in context or not to be believed in its full inheritance, which is totally wrong. If we do believe in the word of God, we have to understand that there is authority and there's power and strength behind the word of God. So in order to be healed, what does God require of us is that we would believe upon that word of God and believe in it so much so that we know that is, it is truthfulness. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Um, so committing to God for healing is to understand that the word of God is like a seed. And I'll give you an example. You remember that parable of the sower that went to once uh, that, uh, that went to sow? Four different mm -hmm. types of seeds, right? Fell into mm -hmm. four different types of grounds. Actually, the same seed, excuse me, fall, uh, fell into uh, four different types of grounds. One seed fell into uh, thorns and uh, th uh, thistles. The other one uh, fell in, uh, into a uh, rocky ground. Uh, one of them, I believe, I don't quite remember where, but it, I, I believe it, it fell by the wayside. And there's one of them that fell into a good ground and then sprouted. And from that point, you know, you know, bear many, many fruits. Mm. So that seed is none other but the word of God. So what God was trying to put on display here through the words of our Lord Jesus Christ is that, you know, conveniently, the word of God, if it's sowed in a good soil, it will sprout and it will deliver fruits. All right. Mm. So when you pray believing, you have to understand that you have to believe that that seed is sown into a good ground. Because if you don't believe when you pray, then it's as if you have taken that seed, which is the word of God, and thrown it into, you know, a place that is rocky or into thorns and thistles or, you know, uh, through the wayside. And that's why it won't be bearing fruits. The reason why is because there is doubt in your heart. There's a lack of mm -hmm. faithfulness in there. So the seed being the word of God needs to be planted in, you know, good soil for it to bear much fruits. I'll give mm -hmm. you an example. It's like a farmer that is waiting for his harvest right? 
and, and, and he hasn't sold anything. It would be ironic for that farmer to keep on waiting, expecting something if no seeds were ever sown. So unless you actually sow something, you can't expect any harvest at the end of the springtime. So when you sow a seed, you have to believe that that seed was sown so that seed can actually bring forth good fruits. Mm. And that seed is none other than the word of God. So what does it tell you? That we have to believe in the word of God before even we pray. And I'll go as far as actually making you turn to uh, Mark eleven twenty four. Let's go there together. You guys with me? Yes. yes. Mark yes. Mark eleven twenty four. Are you guys there? Yeah. Okay. Amen. Amen. So Mark twenty four, eleven twenty four. So reading. Uh, from verse 24 and onwards, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. All right. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your father also is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Hmm. Isn't it interesting that the Lord is saying that whatever you ask in prayer, believe and it shall be yours. Once again, this is a display of how important faith is. Faith is the foundation of all things. Faith is the pillar of our faith. Faith is a pillar of our faith. Think about it like that. Honestly, it's just very simple and very simply put. Faith is the foundation of all things. And mm -hmm. faith is the foundation of our faith. You know, many people have different faith out there. Their faith are discredited. Why? Because they don't believe in the one true God. We believe that we have a God that is very much alive. It's not the God of the dead. So today when we pray, we believe the word of God. We believe that everything that God said would happen, will happen if we pray by faith. So everything will be given unto us and rendered to us according to our faith. Just like Mark eleven twenty four 24 says it right here. Let's repeat it just for the sake of you hearing it and you know, believing it. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, Forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. So we do see that there is something here. There's a boundary. There's a limitation. What is that restriction that might cause God to not listen to us? The fact that there is still unforgiveness in our heart. So there's somewhat of unforgiveness in our heart. If it's, even if it's the smallest traces ever, God requires that we would ask for forgiveness first from that person, that we would confess our sins, for example, to whoever we might have hurt or whoever we still have on forgiveness towards in our hearts before mm -hmm. even laying out our sacrifice on the altar. God mm -hmm. expects us to do so before we come ahead mm -hmm. in front of him and ask anything because otherwise God won't be hearing from us. The only way God could be hearing from us is if we lay everything, you know, uh, uh, if we come in with a pure sacrifice and the only one, the only way that could be done is if we would, you know, have asked forgiveness from any person that we would have hurt, for example. Mm. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So there is Amen. a restriction. There's a boundary right there, right? There is something that stands in the way from God accepting our sacrifice. And that is unforgiveness or any other sin that lays in our heart somewhere in the depths of our heart. We need to get rid of it before even we come to God and ask for anything that we potentially want for the future that obviously, you know, falls under the will of God. Does it make sense? Amen. Yes. Amen. Right. Bless you, Pastor. Bless you. Thank you so much. Um, if you can go back to saying to the part where you were saying uh, faith is the pillar of faith. Can you break it down a little bit for me, please? No, the way I said it's just for you to remember how faith is important. I said faith, you know, is the base, the basis of our faith. It's it's not in the Bible. I just want to, I want to show you how it's important everything. faith is. Okay. That faith is the substance of all things which we believe in that are yet not here in our life, but we know that if we believe, right, by faith, 
it, it will be given unto us. Hence why the Bible says that faith is the substance of, of the things, you know, uh, 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 I believe it, it goes as the following. It says, faith is the substance of the things um, hoped for, uh, the evidence of the things not seen. All right. What that boils down to is that faith being the foundation of all things, right, uh, 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 leads us to believe with assurance and confidence in the future plans of God before even we're there. Understanding that although they're not happening at the moment, and although we don't see them, we believe in them because God has given us a clear indication of the fact that they will come to happen if we believe by faith. Amen. All right? So although I don't see what tomorrow brings, although I don't see what tomorrow holds for me, and I've got no clue of what the future may hold for me, I understand that by faith in God's word, it shall be done. Amen. All right? Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Amen. So without faith, it is impossible to please God. In other words, one of the things that God hates the most is the lack of faith. It is a trait that God despises and abhors. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you why. Because a lack of faith would imply that, hey, I have more faith in myself than I have faith in God. And that by itself becomes a form of idolatry as well. It's like you're saying, God, I am more righteous than you are. Although you have promised that these things will come to happen, I still believe in my plans, my ways, my understanding, my wisdom, more so than I believe in your wisdom, more, more, more so than I believe in your plans, more so than I believe in your promises. And what that actually tells God is that you would rather believe in your own self and make yourself your own God. Many people have more faith in doubts and the fears of what this world is pushing for, the restrictions, the, the bans. And I'm, trying to, I'm not trying to call out anybody here. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just saying the obvious. Rather than actually putting their faith in the Lord. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight. It is, it is a progressive walk. You know, the Lord is working in our lives and God is molding us, shaping us to become more faithful day, day after day. However, we have to strive to have that mindset in us that was in Jesus Christ. Have in yourself the same mind that was in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Lord was faithful. He trusted the Lord, his Father, with everything that he did, every word that came out of his mouth. He did everything for the glory of God. He was faithful at all time, right? He wasn't desisting away from faith. He wasn't wavering off. Everything that he did, he did it for the glory of the Father by faith. I saw today we're asked to also walk by faith. Don't walk by sight. Although I don't see something and it does make me nervous, for example, you know, I, I still believe the Lord because God said so, right? I don't, I don't walk by emotions because many people are stirred up by emotions. They would rather, you know, operate by emotions instead of operating by faith. The Lord says operate by faith instead of emotions or sight because if it came down to emotions only, then, you know, one day you could be happy. Right next day, something happens. You get triggered and you've had enough of, you know, what's coming against you. And then you become angry and then you stop believing. The Lord says, keep on believing because faith is something that has to be done throughout the course of our life. It doesn't start somewhere and finish it somewhere else. It's something that follows us for the rest of the days of our life. And in fact, we were saved by faith, right? Faith and grace through faith, not our own works as we boast. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So faith is the foundation of all things. And we work, you know, we, we, work, we start working with, when we start, when we start working with that principle, everything follows through. Mm. Now, the reason why I'm actually laying out that foundation is because I want to show you that healing also could happen by faith. If you have enough faith in the Lord and in his promises and what the word says as a fundamental foundation for us, then we can't be shaky. You know, nothing will come against us. The Lord will heal us. If we commit ourselves to the word of God, he will heal us. So I'd like you to actually turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, please. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Guys, there? Mm -hmm. there. Amen. 
Amen. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wound, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but I've now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. What this is referring to is the blood covenant of our Lord Jesus Christ. When the Lord died on the cross and he shed his blood on Calvary 2,000 years ago, he brought atonement for us. Not only the atonement of sins, but the atonement of infirmities. The Lord was the high priest that had entered the rest of God once and for all, right? Making it possible for us. He became that blameless, spotless Lamb of God, acceptable and pleasant unto the Father, without any blame, without any spot. So if we would believe in him, put our trust in him, we would not only be saved from our sins, but also saved from our iniquities. So there is such thing as an atonement in the blood of Christ Jesus that covers and redeems us not only from our for, uh, from our sins and our iniquities but also from our infirmities we have to believe it we have to understand it we have to know it when the lord speaks about healing here he doesn't speak about spirit, spiritual healing only he speaks about physical healing as well and i'll show you why because this verse that we just read is a direct prophecy from the old testament a prophetic messianic prophecy from Isaiah 53. Now, if we lead back in the Old Testament, which we're going to do, if you go to Isaiah 53 with me, please, Isaiah 53, I'll show you how this word sickness is literally pointing at a physical sickness and not a spiritual sickness. And that, once again, my friends, is the promise of God to heal us from any sicknesses in our bodies. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 53 verse, verse 1. Psalm 53. We're going to start reading from verse 1. Tanya, Psalms are you with me? Did you say Psalm 53? Psalm 53, yes. Oh, okay. uh, excuse me. No, I said Isaiah. Isaiah 53. Yeah. I must, yeah, and I'm sorry if I'm mistaking it for a psalm, but it's actually Isaiah 53. That is where I want you guys to go. Turn to Isaiah 53. We're going to start reading through verse 1, then following. Who has believed what he has heard from us? So this is literally 700 years before our Lord even showed up on the scene, right? This is a prophecy mm. from Isaiah alongside one of the many prophecies. There's over 340 prophecies or even a little over 340 prophecies in the Old Testament that point at the ushering of the Christ, all right, that will come on the scene Amen. and bring his kingdom on earth. So this one being one of them. That is Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. You know, this is interesting because how odd when, when we see, you know, Jesus portrayed with blue eyes and blonde hair and a beautiful, majestic, mm -hmm. you know, dazzling man. That's not what the Lord um looked like the lord in in fact was quite the opposite he was um he was very uh typically jewish and he had no form or majesty in him that we should look at him the bible says right not out of my own words out of the words of god himself right here in verse two and no beauty that we should desire in him so he would kind of you know he had a darker complexity he was very middle eastern looking um not a beautiful beautiful man the reason why this happens is because the lord i guess wanted to not trick people in, but, um, you know, see the condition of their hearts because all of them were after the outwardly appearances and were looking for a king, a man that was majestic and arrayed with beautiful linen clothes and who came with authority and military power and strength and all of the above. Yeah. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now, I want you to stop there. Pause. Grief is not spiritual. I've looked it up. And in all cases, in all scenarios, this word is literally translated in the Hebrew to kali. Kali, once again, that word that I told you to write down earlier, the Hebrew word for physical sickness. Sickness. All right? Mm -hmm. So this is a physical sickness. Now, let us reiterate and try to read this verse once again. Now, what a different reading. Let's switch grief over to sickness instead. And let's see if it does make sense or not. He was despised and rejected by man. If we carry on, it says a man of sorrows and acquainted with sickness. 
all right? And as one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we esteem them not. Surely he has borne our griefs, the same way once again, he has borne our sicknesses and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him strict and smitten by God and afflicted. Now, I'm not saying that this can be spiritual. What I'm saying is that if we make that connection that I told you earlier about, when sin entered the world to Adam and Eve that were beguiled and ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, sin brought what? Sicknesses, infirmities. It brought a curse on the whole world. When the Lord cursed the whole world, now the reason why we see so many people dying, the reason we die, the reason why there's spiritual death, but also physical death, because there's something such as sin that is living in our, in our, in, a, in, a, in, 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 a, in our beings. And that needed to be eradicated. And the Lord came in. What he did is we, he reversed that, of course, right? It was, you know, death on the cross. He, he, he reversed that. So he would bring back the preservation of how men were in the beginning when we were in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Right? He had to die on the cross and he had to become a curse on the cross. He had to become sin on the cross. So he would crucify that sin. So if we would believe in him, the symbolism behind it is that we would just as equally as him also crucify that sin and you know, re, um, be reborn in the newness of life that he promises through the resurrection of the Holy Spirit. All right? You guys with me? Still here, brother. Thank you. Amen. So verse five, but he was pierced for our transgression. So notice that this is talking about our sins. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was laid the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wound, we are healed. Amen. 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 So today hallelujah. We, amen. Hallelujah. So today when we took the blood of Christ Jesus to, you know, over our bodies from head to toe, and we say, Lord, cover us, cleanse us, wash away our sins, but also our infirmities, we have to believe it by faith because that's what the word says. And the Lord asks us to what? You know, believe in that seed, believe in that word. That's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to break down that word and elaborate it so we can get a clear understanding of it, but also be able to reapply it in faith in our lives so we might be able to be healed not only spiritually, but physically. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And the biggest proof of that is that if we go a little bit and notch further, uh, when James in the book of James speaks about, you know, sicknesses in the church among the body of, uh, of, of, of Christ, uh, the, the body of, excuse me, of, of Christians, he says, confess to one another, right? So you can be healed. Why? Because Paul even himself speaks about if we are sick, could it be, could it be, uh, could it be because we are sinning because we are living in an ongoing habitual life of sin? When we cut off sin at the root, when we don't entertain sin that is crouching by our door, when we leave sin aside, when we are obedient to the Lord, not only do we get revelations and blessings from God, but we also get to be healed physically because sin, whenever it's entertained and whenever it takes over our hearts, our minds, right? It is corrupting our internal being, the inner man, the spirit man that is inside of, of us, thus affecting the body. I'll give you an example. You know, when you have, when you see people so hurt, so broken, still entangled, you know, with this life of anxiety, depression, stress, not being fully uh, uh, set free, um, having different addictions, right? Going down that pit of darkness in a life. It's because they're not committing the lives to Jesus. Why? Because they're not being able to be set free because they are not accepting the Lord. And as long as they're doing that, right, they're still in bondage. They're still very much in slavery, but the Lord came to set the captives free. And we, when we are set free from our unforgiveness, our habits, our bad habits, our addictions, when we commit ourselves to God, from moving away from, you know, our iniquities, whatever it may be, alcoholism, drug abuse, sexual immorality, malice, lies, discord, this and that, which people are fashioned to do in this world. That's when we come across the true light of God. And when, once that happened, our formal man has changed. If any man be in Jesus Christ, he's a new man today. He's a new creature. So we go from being broken in our spirit, in our inner man, to being set free, right? Because now it's the spirit of God that is that is replacing that inner man that was there from the from my old me, right? And and now now that the, the the spirit of God is inside of us, 
you know, God preserves us from all sicknesses and all diseases. So could it be that, you know, the reason why we fall in sicknesses or diseases sometimes because we have fallen in sin. There might be sin in our lives. There might be something that we're not truly cutting off. We're not putting on the altar. We're not saying, Lord, I rendered this all to you. I give you this. You remember what the Lord said in 2 Chronicles? He said, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and come to me prayfully and be obedient and leave their sins aside, then I will hear from heaven and I will come and heal them and heal their land. The reason why people are not healed today, the reason why we see so many you know, sick people, so many dying people, so many people struggling with diseases and illnesses and being in pain and hospital beds and it's because they're not fully, you know, set free. They're not obedient. They're not seeking for God. They're not searching for God's face. They haven't humbled themselves in front of God. And thus, piling up sicknesses upon themselves. All right? Amen. Does it make sense? Do you feel like it's something that is speaking to your hearts? Are you feeling convicted? Yes, Pastor Hassan. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So before we go ahead and see how to truly actually, you know, do this and what is the process that we ought to follow in order to actually get ourselves out of sicknesses by faith so we can actually get receive the healing from God freely, we're still going to turn into a few passages together. All right. So I'd like you to actually turn to Leviticus 14, 18. That's in the Old Testament, please. Leviticus, by the way, for those who don't know, is one book after the book of Exodus. Chapter 14, verse 18. Now, I just want to bring this to your attention. It's very important, uh, which many Christians, by the way, fail to understand out there. Everything that was in the Old Testament, which was physical, has become a spiritual propitiation today. Everything was subjected under Jesus' feet. That's what the Bible says in Colossians 4, right? We have to understand that. What used to be a mirroring of the spiritual things to come in this day and age, right? Ever since the Lord died on the cross to provide a salvation, the salvation of the, of, 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 of the cross, everything used to be physical back then, right? So it's like a mirroring, physical slash spiritual, physical versus spiritual. The Levitical priest back in the Old Testament, um, hypothetically speaking, um, Aaron, he used to sacrifice animals, right, for the people of Israel. And most of his sacrifices were done under two reasons, under two facets. One, for the spiritual needs, which were, you know, uh, spiritual forgiveness, of course, the sins of the people, either for himself and for the people and their loved ones. They used to commit to that sacrifice, right, the shedding of blood, because without the shedding of blood, the Bible says that there is no remission of sins which the Lord, by the way, became that lamb, as I mentioned earlier, you know, and shed his blood for us to be forgiven our sins and have eternal life. But that Levitical priest under the Levitical priesthood had to also atone in the same way with different bullocks, different animals, different sacrifices for the intent of actually physical healing. I bet you didn't know that. And now Jesus being the high priest on the order of Melchizedek in the Old Testament, just as mentioned in the book of Hebrews, Jesus becoming the propitiation of that to the blood of the covenant for the atonement of all in all who believe in him, not only washes us free from our forgiveness, for, from our sins rather, excuse me, as the intercessor, as the high priest that intercedes for us in heaven, but also washes us free. And that's a promise that is sure from our sicknesses. And I'm going to show you why. We're going to start reading Leviticus 14, 18, please. All 
All right. And the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed. Then the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. This is talking about sickness. You remember when James says that let the elders of the church, right? Whoever is sick, let the elders of the church come and pour oil on their head if they're sick. The same practice here in the Old Testament now renewed in the New Testament. If we keep reading, the priest shall offer a sin offering to make atonement for him who is to be cleansed from his uncleanness. And afterwards, he shall kill the burnt offering. So this is uncleanness is a general terminology, not to be used only for spiritual uncleanness, but for physical uncleanness, because there were lepers back in Israel. They were considered unclean. Why? Because they were intermingled with people, because as long as they weren't washed with that washing ritual, right? After that, the priest would have conveyed that now they are set clean because they no longer have, have, have leprosy. This just proves us that it is not just spiritual uncleanness, but it's also physical uncleanness because many of these lepers, many of these sick people back then in Israel were um, suffering from physical uncleanness. And the priest had to render a sacrifice, right? An atonement that was done for every person that was unclean, either spiritually or physically. And then if we keep on reading in verse 20, notice, and the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar, thus the priest shall make atonement for him and he shall be clean. Now, you might say, well, we still don't really have a clear indication that this is physical. You know, this might be spiritual. If you read the context, you'll see that it's actually also physical, but just for the sake of the argument, let's go to Numbers 16. So Numbers 16, 46 to 50, please. So the book of Numbers 16, 46 to 50. Uh, I don't think 46 exists. Numbers? Yeah. There is definitely a 16 in Numbers, yes. No, 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 no. Uh, is there numbers 15 or 16? Excuse me, 46 to 50. Did I say 16? Mais cha chapitre quoi? 16. Chapitre, chapitre 16 a juste 35 versets. Non. Non. 50. Nombre, nombre, numbers? Yes. Numbers, yeah. Nombre. It has uh, 50 verses. Okay, I got it. All right, so this is really interesting, you guys. So for some of you guys who are still doubting, look at that. If Moses back then asked Aaron to go ahead and do this atonement, for a sickness because there's a plague that actually had hit the people of Israel. And that plague was so intense that it kills. I'll tell you how many people it killed. That plague killed 14,700 people. 14,700 people, 14,700 people had died of that plague. Aaron, as a priest, in his mediatorial office which the lord jesus christ by the way does the same thing today but on a obviously higher you know spiritual level he's our mediator right one mediator the man christ jesus between man and god our intercessor intercedes before the father so aaron who was high priest as a mediatorial as someone that mediates between god and the people of israel stood for the people between the dead and the living and made an atonement for the removal of the plague, the healing of the body. So don't you ever let anybody tell you that Jesus Christ cannot heal. If Aaron was able to consecrate an atonement, a living sacrifice, an animal sacrifice for the people of Israel to be healed by God himself, because God is the one who provides healing ultimately, how much more is our Lord Jesus Christ as high priest sitting you know, in heaven the right hand of God interceding for us for our sicknesses and our diseases can heal us from all which we are going through. So Christ, our mediator, by his atonement, redeemed us from the plague of sin and sickness. Now, I'm going to read verse 46. And Moses said to Aaron, take your censer and put fire on it from the altar and lay incense on it and carry it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord, the plague has begun. So Aaron took it as Moses said, 
and ran into the midst of the assembly. And behold, the plague had already begun among the people. And he put on the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stopped. The plague was stopped. Do you see that, guys? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Repeat. Can you repeat that again? That repeat. was powerful. Amen. Repeat it so, again. All right. So we're going to read this again, just for the sake of you know, glorifying the Lord. May all the glory and all the magnitude goes to God. And Moses said to Aaron, take your censer and put fire on it from the altar and lay incense on it and carry it quickly to the congregation. Make atonement for them for wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. So Aaron took it as Moses said and ran into the midst of the assembly and behold the plague had already begun among the people and he put on the incense and made atonement for the people and he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stopped now those who died in the plague plague were 14,700 besides those who died in the affair of Korah and Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the of the tent of meeting when the plague was stopped so see people had died now I'm not saying that people won't die now, once again, it is all based on our faith. How much are we obedient to the Lord? Because I said earlier, Amen. Second Chronicles says, that if we are obedient to God, if my people would, you know, uh, 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 leave their sins aside, right? Whatever practices they may be entangled with and come to me prayfully, submitting themselves to me in obedience and humility, then I will hear from heaven and I will come down and I will heal their hearts and heal their lands. This is physical healing that this is talking about, by the way, in second, the book of Second Chronicles. I don't know where specifically, but on your spare time, you can you know, search it uh, when you're on your own. For now, what I want to point you to, and I want to point your attention to, is that Aaron was asked by Moses to go ahead and make an atonement for the people. And then as soon as he made that atonement, guess what happened? The plague had, had gone, had disappeared. Now, many people had died. But does it mean that God didn't answer the call? No, he did answer the call. Could it be that these people were probably unfaithful? Maybe. Today, you know, people, these Christians that say that God cannot heal comp completely, you know, point at God and say, well, you see, God doesn't heal completely. If God wills, you know, he can let people be eaten away by, eaten away by sicknesses and by diseases. God wants us to be healed, but once again, it is all in accordance to our faith. How much are we faithful towards God? How much do we have that faith that boils inside of us to believe that God can truly, you know, release us from all sicknesses and diseases? Now, I'm not saying that if you die, you know, if, if let's say, when, 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 when somebody dies that, um, uh, uh, when somebody dies that, uh, you know, uh, automatically. Uh, God is not healing them. All I'm saying is that, you know, there's, there's two categories. There is one segment, which is as long as we're still alive and our time hasn't come and we haven't rendered the last breath, if we pray, believing by faith that God can heal us, he will most definitely. I'm telling you guys, however, my, if my, however, if my time has come and I have to die, then, you know, let it be so because, you know, I'm, I will have to die at some point. And there's, there's a difference. There's a distinctiveness here between me you know, living out my, my, my life and, and yet, you know, not uh, uh, having to die and praying out to God and asking that he would, by faith, heal me as opposed as, you know, getting to this point in my life where, you know, now it is conclusive. You know, it is the end of all things. Now I have to die. And, and when that happens, then you know what? You know, everybody has to die, right? Yes. Yes, hallelujah. Amen. 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 Let's go to Proverbs uh, chapter 4, verse 20 to 22. Please. Proverbs, sorry, what chapter again? Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 to 22. Are you guys there? Yes. Yes. Mm. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your heart to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them healing to all their flesh. Flesh. Healing 
to all their flesh. Am I imagining this? Am I dreaming? Are you seeing the same as I'm seeing? Yes. Are you guys also reading the same thing that I'm reading? Amen. What's it saying? Their flesh. Amen. So let's repeat. Let's let's just read it for the sake of reading it once again. Je le lis en, je le lis en français moi et ça dit il assure la santé du corps. What else do you want, man? Yeah, et, et j'aime bien aussi ce que le verset suivant qui parle un peu, qui rejoint ce que tu dis. Ça dit par dessus tout veille soigneusement sur ton cœur car il est la source de tout ce que fait ta vie. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. And and can we, you think, um, for sure you guys are probably going to say yes, but I'm still going to ask you. Uh, you think we can make a relation between, you know, what you just said here about the heart, right? The heart um, carrying the word of God. And, and that other verse, which I, I love that says, oh, you know, uh, Lord, I've hidden your word in my heart so I wouldn't sin against you. Sin being the cause of death, the cause of sicknesses, of illness. And God asking yeah. us that we would carry, you know, that word of God in our hearts, that we would hold on to that word of God in our hearts. Like Psalm 1 says, right? Blessed is the man that meditates on the word of God day and night. When we meditate on the word of God, we understand the depths and the heights and the widths of what the word is all about and then cleave to it and understand that it's, there, there's, a power, there, there's a form of authority and power for us in our lives through everything that we go through. That as long as we believe by faith in the word of God and the promises of God, which is why here what Solomon is, is telling his son to do is he's asking him to be attentive to my word. So notice the first, the, the first procedure here in order to get that healing is to be attentive to the word of God. How many people do you know of that are not healed because they're not attentive to the word of God? People that read the word very religiously, right? Diagonally, reading the word, the word just for the sake of reading the word, not stopping to break it down, not, not stopping to be attentive to it. To be attentive to someone, to something rather is not just to hear, but to listen. You've got people that listen to us sometimes and pretend like they do care about what we're saying. However, they're not really hearing us out. They're listening to us. Excuse me, it's the opposite. They hear us out, but they, they don't listen. But if we do listen to the word of God, then that might imply that we are attentive to the word of God. When we become attentive to the word of God and when we incline our ear to God's saying, and when we don't let these things escape from our sight, which is verse 21, and keep the words of God within our hearts, then they became life for us who find them and healing to our flesh. Amen, Pastor. Yes, there's a big difference between the two. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. So I believe listening is when you carefully, you know, are attentive to someone's words, as opposed to just hearing, you know, which people do commonly. You know, they'd like to say that they're actually listening, but they're not, however. They're kind of just hearing it out and not really caring afterwards. Exactly. And I think that we can see, we can notice it, we can feel it in our spirits. Sometimes people don't really care about the matters that we're saying. They're just there to pretend that they're truly. And I mean, we see Christians like that in different churches, but I can't really blame everybody. I can't blame the churches around the world, you know, for, or the Christians around the world for not really understanding the word because sometimes, you know, It's, it's, like, it's like the pastor, you know, that is behind the pulpit doesn't quite get it because he's not getting it or because he is a false prophet, for example, he will lay out false truth. You know, the ways of a pastor, uh, 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 you know, they're, they're not always good. Some pastors out there, they're there for the money. They're there for the wrong reasons and they're not catered with the truth and the matters of the Bible. Instead, they're catered, you know, by means of gain and selfish interests and The congregants who are parts of these churches, while they listen and, and, and they, they, they hear, excuse me, they don't listen. Why? Because either they're not interested or, you know, they just believe everything that the pastor is saying. And most of the things that he's saying are just false. Hence why the Lord says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. We have spoken about this before. We said that going back to the word of God, meditating on it, and just like Solomon here very wisely is telling his son to do and warning him to you know, be attentive to God's words, inclining, therefore, his ear to God's sayings and not letting them escape from his side. 
and, and keeping them within his heart. And then after he does these things, then he will have life through these words and healing will come along in his flesh. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful promises of God. Amen. You guys with me? Hallelujah. Amen. Tanya, am I going too fast or are you okay? Are you asking me? Yes, I'm asking you. Yeah, yeah, everything's fine. I, I was just thinking about the, the, the pastor thing that you said. Like, um, I, if, if it's famous, then question it. <laughs> any pastor, like any Christian pastors that are famous and well-known, question it. <laughs> Amen. Amen, sister. Amen. You're God, absolutely we're right. Famous, we're not popular. We've got a small church, but hey, big, bigger churches, bigger problems. Smaller churches, smaller problems. All right. Amen. It's funny because I was watching a video on uh, jo Joel Austin, I think yeah. it is, and another pastor named Kenneth. Um, okay. like uh, just like earlier this morning. So it's funny that you mentioned that. <laughs> Yeah, wolves and sheep's clothing, unfortunately. Um, 11, so 1 Corinthians 11, 20, 29 to 30. So verses 29 to 30. Actually, one verse, 29 to 30. You guys there? Amen. Yes. For anyone who eats and drinks, I'm just going to give you the context real quick here. So before we start reading, Paul is actually addressing this uh, letter to the Corinthian church. As you guys may already know, I'm preaching to the choir most probably, but, but there were a lot of, um, a lot of uh, flaws in that church. There was a lot of wickedness, a lot of rebellion going on. It was sexual immorality, as you know. And this kind of ties up to what, what I said earlier uh, uh, from the book of James, that uh, James tells us that, you know, if anybody uh, has sinned, let them confess to one another so we can be healed, right? And then we spoke about how sin, when it comes in, and if you're still living in habitual sin, could be a triggering of these sicknesses and these diseases that we have in our body, right? The body condition is like that because there's obviously something behind it, something uh, we are either living in this or we're not... Uh, fully repentant because we are ignoring that there might be something that God is trying to tell us to move away from. And I'm not saying that sometimes uh, or oftentimes, you know, it is uh, conscious or it is willful. Sometimes it's unwillful. Sometimes we might not even know it, that there's something that we're doing that God despises, but we have to go back to the Lord and ask for more discernment and more wisdom and God will reveal these things to us and which are the things which we have to cut off. All right. Amen. So 1 Corinthians um, 11, so chapter 11, verse 29. You guys there? Amen. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. So Paul is not saying that everybody's going to die. He's saying the reason why. So he's giving a reason. He's giving a cause. He's giving a... You know, uh, uh, he's justifying, he's not justifying, but he's pointing at what are the reasons that might have some people kill, be killed, uh, be, be uh, yeah, not be, uh, not be killed, excuse me, be weak or ill and, and, and even dying. It's because they're, they're not discerning righteously. They're eating and drinking without discernment of their bodies and they're drinking judgment on themselves. Now I want to I want to I want to I want to extend on on the on the on the context here. So we're going to read just a few verses above, if you if you will. Let's start at verse twenty three, just for the sake of understanding the passage a little bit more in depth. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, "This is my body, which is for you." Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse, 20, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, however, whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord 
in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Verse 30, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So very clearly here, you know, Paul is establishing the reason as to why these people are, you know, uh, uh, dying in, in, in the church, the church, that same church that he, would, he was addressing, the church of Corinth. He's telling them that when they come together in communion, right, partaking in the, in, in, in the sacraments of the Lord Jesus Christ, that some of them are undiscernful. Some of them are doing things in, in a very unworthy manner. Right? They're not self-examining their, their walk. They're not really, you know, introspecting on their walk. They're drinking that cup, which is the representation of the blood of all Lord Jesus Christ shed for us for the atonement of sins, and eating from the bread, right, which is also the uh, significant significance of Jesus's body broken for us on the cross. And they're doing it in a very unworthy manner because they're sinning, or they're living, you know, in an ongoing life of sin. And they're still partaking in these things. And the judgment of God, therefore, is falling on them. So that just shows you how serious this is. When we come together and we eat, you know, from the sacraments and we partake in that communion, which we're called to partake, right, together. Whether in drinking from the cup or eating from the bread, people that get sick is because, just like Paul says it here, they are not doing it in a worthy manner, thus, you know, creating these illnesses in them and then even dying. So sin is the cause. It is the root of all things. Have you noticed? This is the commonality that we have been seeing throughout all these passage, passages, all these verses that I've been showing you. That sin is a cause. It is the root behind it. Now, I'm not saying always, but at least from what we, you know, uh, pointed at. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, what is not sin for us could be sin for God and vice versa. Which is why we ought to mm -hmm. ask God, you know, for the sermon. What is it exactly that I did wrong? And sometimes it's just as small as a trace. As I said, it doesn't have to always be an ongoing, you know, repetitive, recurrent sin like sexual immorality, for example, could be anything else, could be a small thing that God sees, God perceives, but yet we can ourselves perceive. Therefore, the importance of getting on our knees and calling out to God and saying, Lord, what is it exactly that I did? Is there anything that I need to change in my life? Is there a habit? Is there a way um, which I do that is not good for you, that does not satisfy you? And God will reveal it to us in due time. All righty. You guys following? Amen. Yes. I, I'm just thinking and reflecting what you're saying, Pastor Hassan. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us somewhere else he made... He was made sin for us who know no sin. Likewise, he hath made him sick for us who know no sickness. Peter writes, who his own self bear our sins. We read this earlier in his own body on the tree, First Peter. Isaiah declares, surely our sicknesses he hath borne and our pains he hath carried them. Lisa translate, that's another, that's a writer. Uh, so I quote, only our sickness did he bear, having none of his own. See, he bore our sicknesses, not his, because he didn't have any. He was perfect in all of his ways. He was blameless and spotless because he was without sin. Right? right. Somebody asked to actually bear our sins and our iniquities. Our Lord did it, although he didn't have any sins in him. One of the seven redemptive names of God is Jehovah Rapha. And that stands for, or is translated, 
I am the Lord thy physician, or I am the Lord the, that healeth thee. I'm going to read to you what this means. I'm going to read to you the descriptive, descriptive um, you know, definition. This name is given to reveal to us our redemptive privilege of being healed. This privilege is purchased by the atonement. The redemptive chapter of Isaiah declares, Surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. For the sake of argument, I have reserved this name for the last. The fact is that the very first covenant God gave after the passage of the Red Sea, which was so distinctively typical of our redemption, was the covenant of healing. It was at this time that God revealed himself as our physician by the first redemptive and covenant name, Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord that healeth thee. This is not only a promise, it is a statue and ordinance. That's God himself that literally said, I am the Lord who heals you in the Old Testament. Jehovah Rapha? Jehovah Rapha, yes. And may so, I know, may I please know what verse that is? And uh, where is? It's in the Old Testament. I'm going to have to search it for you. Uh, but Thank I'll, you. I'll send it to you uh, later if you want to, all right? Thank you very much. No worries. And so cor corresponding to this ancient ordinance we have in the command of james 5 14 a positive ordinance of healing christ's name confess to each other you remember that's what james says he tells us confess to one another so you may be healed this is a sacred this is a sacred and binding on every church today as the ordinances of the lord's supper and christian baptism but why is it that so many few people speak about this See, because Christianity has become intellectualism today. People don't want to commit to God's promises because if they have an understanding, because this pastor or that pastor said so, or, you know, uh, uh, explained so, then we're just going to roll with it. Who cares about what God says? You know, nobody wants to go back to the word and dig in deeper, right? And see what the Lord says from cover to cover. There's a context, there's explanation. I'm pretty sure there's hundreds of other verses. I just gave you, you know, a couple of verses for the sake of time. But if you guys want to dig in deeper and try to research this, you know, healing topic on your own and, and see for yourself, please, by all means, be my guest. There's always more profoundness to the word of God. You guys know it very well. And it's all about Amen. just spending time with the Lord and sitting down and saying, Lord, what is it exactly that you want to reveal to me? And God will speak to you. Right. The Bible is a treasure. The word of God is like a treasure that, you know, a man bought and then uh, he hid in, in a field, a treasure that he found, actually. And then he bought a field and he dig the hole and then, uh, you know, he hid that treasure in the field. The word of God is so rich. And there's so Amen. much we can learn from it. So when somebody says something, you know, it's so easy to kind of go like, hey, bro, what are you talking about? You know, this is what it is. And then point blank you know there's no need for us to have any conversation about this you know don't even hear them out just toss whatever they say in the garbage it is fit for garbage as long as it's not in the word of god if they do have you know biblical backing up to do please ask them to show you where in the bible god bless you sister because otherwise don't listen to it don't care about what they say, right? Because so many people want to say so many things, and especially Christians. That's why the Lord said, in the last days, through the, the words of Paul, many will have tickling ears, right? Itchy ear for false doctrines. He also said, in these perilous times, many will come in, you know, they will profess that they are Christians. Do you know how many Christians there are around you that are not Christians? And sometimes I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to say what I'm saying to uh disappoint you or, or or get you to to this to, to to despair i'm just saying that be careful because not all not every brother is a brother not every sister is a sister you know uh, the, altering the word of god and 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 and, and distorting it and discrediting it is is a very dangerous thing to do and unless you have the holy spirit you can't really fathom these things you can't really understand these things because a man that does not have the holy spirit is void of any understanding potential you know wisdom from god only when you have the Holy Spirit can you have all that understanding. And that's why so many people will say so many things, but hey, you know, it's fine. Don't even waste your time with them. If they don't want to hear you out, they don't want to listen to you, even if you show them, you know, verses left and right, they won't listen to you simply because their hearts are not in a good place. They're not equipped, like my brother Rafi would say sometimes. Don't waste your time with them. I've learned it the difficult way. I've learned it um, the very hard way. I used to, you know, sit there and then give people, you know, the benefit of the doubt and let them debate and let them argue. 
all day long, but then came a point where I said, enough is enough. I need to cut off these people from my life because they're, 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 they're more toxic than they're actually, you know, healthy for me. Bad company corrupts, especially when it comes down to the word of God, right? We can compromise on our personalities. We can compromise on our lives, but we cannot compromise at any point with the word of God. If God says something, don't let anybody come against it. If they don't want to hear, you know, walk away, just like Jesus did. He said, if you don't believe me, at least believe the works that I did right? They couldn't believe him. Why? Because their hearts were hardened. Yes. Today, if you hear the word of the, of the Lord, heed onto that word, right? But these people don't want to heed onto the Lord. They say they love God. They raise their hands. These are, these are the first people that always say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But when it comes down to the promises of God, hey, they want to quench the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is no longer active today. He can no longer move. He can no longer heal. You know, God cannot heal through his, through his blood covenant. You know, he, he can only heal if he wants. What God wants, he already said in his word. What are you waiting for? Believe it. It shall be given unto you by faith. Pray believing. Blessed is the man that is not seen, but yet believed. Believing is the foundation of all things. Faith is the, of, uh, of, uh, is the foundation of all things. So this is my, uh, this is my, uh, my recommendation to you guys, you know, if there's anybody that you feel like it's just way too much and always trying to discredit the word of God and say things that are not, you know, in the word, if you have tried once, twice, and three times, four times, and at some point it just looks like these people are just filled with strife and anger and resentment and trying to prove a point that is not even in the word of God, then cut them off. That's what I would suggest to you guys. You know, there's no time to be wasted. Amen. Hallelujah. And pray for them. Love on yeah. them. For sure. Love on them. And, and just, you know, I'm not saying don't love on them. Love on them. Anguish for them. Pray that God changes their hearts. But if you can't change them, if you can't help them because they're not willing to help themselves, then, you know, what could you do? There's only so much that you can do, right? So, um, so by one man, sin entered the world and death by sin. The reason why there is illnesses, diseases, pains all over the world, across, everywhere we, uh, we look is because of sin. And if sin is eradicated from our lives, God will see us through. God will heal us if we believe that God can do it and God can definitely do it. So by faith, we stand on his promises, our yes and amen. God can heal us physically. And Sister Anna, this is a promise for you. This is a statement that comes directly from God's wor words, from God's mouth. You will be healed. Declare and decree like the word says, and it shall be given unto you by faith. Amen. Amen. Plead the blood of Christ Jesus over you from the tip of your, uh, the tip of your head all the way down to the sole of your feet, day and night, and ask God in prayer that he would remove it, believing and say, Lord, I thank you already. I thank you already for the work of healing that you are doing in my life. I thank you already for me being healed, believing in advance ahead of time that it shall be given unto you. Claim it. Proclaim it over your life. That's the kind of, you know, spirit that God wants from us. All right. And Amen. If you do that, then trust me, you won't ever you won't ever fall short of God's promises. And God will Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank Hallelujah. you, Pastor Hassan. Thank you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. I'd like Hello. to add a word uh, to encourage uh, my sister Hannah. Uh, just to go back to the concept of faith that uh, Brother Hassan was saying, uh, you know, we uh, the New Testament it talks about that woman was that was very very ill, right? And she had only but faith mm -hmm. to touch the robe of Jesus that was going through a big crowd in order to get completely healed. And literally, this is what Jesus told her: "Your faith is what saved her." Right? So uh, just you know, focus a lot on faith. That God has the, the good will for you, and all you need is to actually grab it. Amen. Thank you, Brother Neil. I remember that verse in the Bible. Amen. And he said, who touched my robe? Because there was so many people in the Amen. crowd. And the woman got down on her knees, and she was crying, and she says, it was me. And then he says, you shall be healed. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen, Jesus. Amen, Lord. So, so we see it, right? We see that the, the kingdom, Sister Anna, the kingdom of God is not just a matter of words. The Lord said it best. He said, the kingdom of God is a matter of authority and power. 
for the Holy Spirit. The multitudes were following all of Jesus Christ everywhere he went. And he laid hands and he healed. He also cast out demons, right? That's all he did. That was a great commission. Today, our great commission is not to sit back and uh, not do anything. At least start by doing something for ourselves. If we heal, then we can truly also help in healing others through the word of God and through the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. But we have to heal Amen. first. In order to help others heal, either you know through prayer, which is intercession of others, or you know the laying of hands and, and expecting them to heal through the Holy Spirit, then we have to also ask for healing for ourselves first. But in order to do that, we have to believe upon the words of God. And fear is is a form of doubt, sister. It is a form of not believing God. Fear is 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 a form of not you know, believing the promises of God. I'm telling you, Sister Anna, you know, I, I've read the, 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 the Bible, you know, long enough. And I'm, once again, I'm still a baby in the faith. You know, all, all of us are to a certain extent. Amen. But, but now, you know, not, I mean, fearing the doubts, uh, fearing, I mean, the enemy uh, in doubting, you know, the word of God is idolatrous to God. So it's either we, you know, trust God and, and not trust the enemy or trust the enemy and not trust God. But the Bible tells us that we cannot serve two masters. Either we, we will hate one and love the other and vice versa, right? So God is a jealous God. So it's, it's either we're all in and fully committed and give him our whole hearts and believe upon his words and his promises that we will be healed. So, 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 so to speak, not to be scared from the things of this world or, you know, kind of fear these things. And then, you know, uh, the Lord says, well, hey, you know, you would rather fear the plans of the enemy. Like, why are you coming? to me right now for healing or for these promises you know like i mean i told you you have to believe and to believe is a practical thing to do it's not just words to believe is to do right and i'm going to finish up with this word of knowledge that james the half brother of our lord jesus christ often says it says he who does right he who, who says rather or hears and does not do is like a man that has looked upon his image in the mirror and then instantly walked away and forgot about his image don't be a sayer don't be a hearer but be a doer put the put the metal to the pedal and do something about it don't sit down or sit back and lay uh lay lay your arms behind your back and crisscross i'm talking in general now I'm not i'm not just i'm speaking you know uh for myself and everybody else and and he who who um uh, who who um who prays not believing james says like a man that is double double-minded a man that does not have faith is like a man that is double-minded we say that we believe in jesus christ that we love him but are we believing in his promises that's what the lord wants to see in us amen amen